Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today talking about baled crop residue as another option for feeding your cattle this winter. Let's kick things off today with Dr. Paul Beck. This is one of those situations that we get into every, you know, so often when you get in droughts and get short on hay. Um, you know, for the most part, our crop producers would rather turn that residues back into the soil and get the nutrients and the organic matter back into the soil for their next crop. But when it becomes a value to, as a feed resource, whenever we're short on hay, the crop producers are willing to go ahead and bale that up and, and ship it when we've seen a lot of truckloads of these crop residues coming in from our, our cropping areas into Oklahoma for use as a livestock uh, feed to get us through the winter. And they make a pretty decent replacement for hay. Um, most of them are, are fairly low quality, um, but there's a range in quality depending on the crop and depending on the conditions whenever they were baled and, and harvested. And let's talk a little bit more about that and give some guidance to our viewers. Not all of these crops when they're baled or this, the crop residue when it's baled, they're not all created equal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, whenever I, I think about straws, stovers, and stalks, you know, they're, those are usually fairly low quality. So wheat straw is something most of us in Oklahoma are familiar with. Um, it's, you know, the aftermath after we harvested a, a, a wheat uh, or, uh, you know, could be any kind of small grain. They're usually about four and a half to 5% crude protein and 45% TDN. Uh, pretty easy to remember, you know, they can be, a, you know, depending on weeds and some other contaminants in there, they may be a little bit higher in quality than that. So there's a range in that. Um, if we look at corn stalks, uh, they're a different appearing crop. Um, they're still there about four and a half to 5% crude protein and, and right in there in the mid 40s as far as TDN or digestibility. Um, but then when we look at, at Milo Stover, the aftermath from a grain sorghum uh, crop, you know, it could be, you know, up over five to seven percent crude protein and, and over 50 to 52 or, or, or so, 55 percent TDN. I've had some uh, samples come back to, to be fairly good quality. So those lower quality, the corn stalks and the wheat straws, uh, Soybean uh, residue is another one that we would think would be higher quality because it's a legume. Uh, it's actually fairly low quality as well because of mostly what's left over is the, the soybean stems. Um, all those take a, quite a bit of supplement to, to meet the requirements of a just a lactate or a gestating cow. Now with that cow with really low nutrient requirements. Uh, they're going to need about 50% TDN and, and about 7% crude protein. So even, even that real low nutrient requirement cow is going to need some supplement to go along with that uh, stalks or wheat straws and that type of product. When we look at the Milo Stover at, you know, 7 to, you know, 8% T, uh, crude protein and 50 to 52% TDN, you know, that will meet the requirements of that gestating cow. So it's, it's actually a fairly nice product. Um, you know, there's still some green leaf material and some um, green stalks in, in that. So it makes a, a, a decent cow hay or, or, or roughage for, for a cow going through the winter. When we start moving into lactating cows, if we have fall calving cows uh, or move closer into our spring calving, you know, time frame, those cows requirements are vastly higher. So all of those products are going to need a lot of supplement to meet those, that cow's requirements. And it could be up to about 10 to 12 pounds of a uh, supplemental feed to mat, that match those requirements. So it sounds like it's really important. It always is, but especially when you're uh, considering this strategy to get that hay tested. Yeah, you know, the hay test is one of the, the most cost effective ways to design a winter feeding program. And it's a very small investment relative to the overall cost of, of that uh, nutrition program for your cow. So for 15 to $20, we can, can get a sample, 
and we, we need to sample every field of, of hay or, or any of these products as, before they come in so that we know what we're getting and know what we're buying. But, you know, sample 10 to 15 percent of, of the, the, the field or at least 15 to 20 bales to get an adequate representation of what's out in that field. And, you know, at minimum, we need to know the fiber levels, the crude protein and, and the digestibility or the total digestible nutrient content of that roughage source. You and the team have covered this topic in the recent Ranchers Lunchtime series and of course your, your newsletter. Yes, we um, had Mary Drunoski, she's a, a scientist out of University of Nebraska-Lincoln, uh, uh, years of experience feeding these crop residues because you know that's where a, a lot of these are coming from and, and you know dealing with the grain sorghum and corn stalks and, and soybean residue. She presented uh, a couple of weeks ago, November 17th, on our Ranchers Thursday lunchtime series. Um, we did a webinar on that. And then we also had a, a article in our newsletter that I wrote uh, based on that presentation, talking about these different qualities and, and, and how to best use those uh, products to feed our cow herd through the winter. And you really kind of have to sit down and map it out. So the county extension office, your local ag educator is also a great resource to, to map it out as well as that forage test, right? Absolutely. Go to your county agent and have them help you get the sampler probe and, and what you need to get your uh, sample analysis done. And then they can sit down with you and help you plan out your winter feed program and, and try to match the you know, nutrient requirement of your hays that you have available to the requirements of your cows and, and what supplements will fit uh, for these different periods throughout the winter. Okay, Paul, great information, thanks a lot. And for a link to the resources we just talked about, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. Another reminder that you can receive discounted forage and water testing through your OSU Local County Extension Office between now and the end of the year. Welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. Most of the state has been able to pick up a little rainfall over the past month. Outside of the Panhandle, rainfall was near normal for most of the state. There were even a few small pockets shown here in blue that received near twice the monthly normal rate. You can see the soil moisture improvement over the past week on this 10-inch fractional water index map. Remember zero being as dry and one as wet as the sensor can read. The greens show the areas that had the biggest increase in soil moisture levels. At the 4-inch level, about 90% of the state is at or near the highest moisture reading. Of course, the Panhandle and even parts of the Northwest continue with the drier than normal trend. At 10 inches, the drought areas of the Northwest show up dramatically on the map. The remainder of the state is in pretty good shape at this depth. At our deepest sensor, you start to see the residual of the year-long drought. Over half of the states need additional rainfall to help replenish moisture levels at this depth. Chances of light rain are fair next week, but a good soaker with some runoff is unlikely this time of year. Now here's Gary with a look at longer term rainfall rates. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well we did get some more precipitation, so that means more improvements on the drought monitor. How expansive were they? Let's take a look at that newest map. Well now we have a good portion of the far southeastern corner and up into east central Oklahoma with no drought. They're simply in abnormally dry conditions and it's not really too dry there. It's simply a, a signifying that they're going out of drought and not coming back into drought. Now as you get to, to the northwest of there, very quickly you get back into the extreme and exceptional drought which travels all the way up into the Oklahoma Panhandle. We have a bit of improvement down in southwestern Oklahoma. Now a lot of those surpluses of November tend to wash out when we go all the way out to the entire fall. So climatological fall, uh, September through November, we look at the rainfall totals. Again, the southeastern corner shows the greatest area of expansive big totals, but we also have a big total up there uh, in Sequoia County, Adair County, 
uh, that region up into uh, east central Oklahoma. So as we continue to travel to the northwest, however, you see those colors switch from the oranges and yellows to the greens. Another look at that rainfall from the fall, um, we do see on this departure from normal rainfall map, the deficits are quite expansive across the state. They run from about seven inches in parts of central and east central Oklahoma, uh, a wide area of three to five inch deficit amounts from central up into northeastern parts of the state. Taking a look forward to December on the outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center, not much of a signal for temperature, but for precipitation, unfortunately, we see increased odds of below normal precipitation across at least the western two-thirds of the state, but especially the western panhandle. Uh, when we translate that into the drought outlook for December, unfortunately, it shows most of the state um, persisting in drought or intensifying. So at least that's through the December uh, 31st time frame. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. It's hard to believe we're already approaching 2023. So Daryl, as we get closer to 2023, um, what is cow slaughter looking like? You know, we've been watching cow slaughter all year. It's it stayed higher than we expected, or at least you know generally expected. Because of the drought, we've been forced to liquidate cow, more cows. Cow slaughter is up over 12% so far this year. Heifer slaughter is up as well. Uh, and so that's sort of artificially, if you will, or temporarily uh, maintained higher levels of slaughter. Um, it's gonna moderate at some point, and there may be some signs that at least the cow slaughter part is moderating a little bit here at the end of the year, but it's still up on a year over year basis. Does that mean beef production is going to be higher? Beef production is higher in 2022 again. Um, you know, it's it's that temporary thing, right? When we're sort of we're sort of eating inventory, if you will, because of the uh, drought force liquidation. So so we're setting a new record for beef production in 2022. But the implication is that as we go forward, there's going to be a, a sharp drop uh, because this is not a sustainable thing. You can't keep doing this, and so we will see uh, at some point, and I think it'll happen uh, as we get into 2023. We'll notice a fairly sharp decrease in beef production. So let's talk about um, uh, livestock prices and let's start with fed cattle. How's that going to be looking like at the end of the year? Fed cattle prices have strengthened uh, at the end of the year. They, uh, they've they taken a nice jump right before Thanksgiving and continue to move higher. And though, you know, even though cattle slaughter has maintained uh, up to this point, I think the market is really reflecting the fact that cattle supplies are getting tighter. And so we're seeing generally all of these cattle markets strengthen as, as we go to the end of the year. What about feeder cattle? Same thing with feeder cattle, uh, sharp increase. Um, you know, we've been doing uh, uh, fall uh, preconditioning calf sales and these markets have really jumped uh, after Thanksgiving. And so, uh, you know, again, supplies are getting tight. I think the market's starting to really feel that pressure and that'll be there as we go into 2023. So we're, we're ending 2022 on a, on a strong note. We are ending in 2022 on a very strong note. I think we're gonna see a, a fairly significant change in conditions as we go into 2023, although we don't really know yet what the drought's gonna do to us, but still, we're going to see a continued tightening of supplies and continued strength in this market. All righty, thanks, Daryl. Dr. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And just a reminder about the 2022 Census of Agriculture. You can respond to the census online right now at agcounts.usda.gov or respond via mail once the paper questionnaires arrive in your mailbox the second week of December. This is an excellent opportunity for Oklahoma producers to tell the country how much agriculture impacts the world. Just by responding, you have the power to influence decisions that will impact American agriculture for years to come in areas such as transportation, farm services, policy, and production practices. The Census of Agriculture also provides valuable information that will be used to plan the future, including community planning, farm succession, availability of operational loans and other funding, and much, much more. The deadline to respond is February of next year. For more information about the Census of Agriculture, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. Good morning, Oklahoma, and welcome to Cow-Calf Corner. Well, in recent weeks, we've talked about a lot of topics that help us address and deal with drought and the continued high heat that plagues cattle and cattlemen across Oklahoma. Our title this week is Preparing for Winter. 
It's hard to believe as we tape out here in early October and it's still pretty warm that winter is just around the corner, but we're going to address things that are always important going into winter and this particular year probably have a little more significance in certain cases. First thing we address is water. Water is the most important of our classes of nutrients. A clean and abundant water supply is absolutely critical. As we get into the freezing temperatures of winter, uh, very low ponds are more subject to freeze over. And whatever we need to do to secure we've got ample water supply for winter, now is the time to be taking action and figuring out that, what that needs to be. Second topic of discussion is securing our winter hay and feed supply. We are critically short of growing days and even if we receive some moisture at this point, the reality is the forage base we have on hand right now is the forage base we're going to have to go through the winter. Hay is already scarce. Uh, prices I would anticipate while already high are going to get higher as we move into the winter months. There are some programs to assist with trucking expenses on hay if we can, se can secure some in other states that are worth checking with your local FSA office about. But the reality is we are, need to deal with the forage base we have and have those winter hay supply and feed demands met at this point or be getting them taken care of in short order. If we don't have ample grass or hay, the third thing we address is that we're going to have to eliminate cow inventory or cull cows. Cow culling has been covered in recent weeks on Cow-Calf Corner. Uh, we can refer back to that in past newsletters or YouTube channels where that's available. But also the potential, as hard as it is to believe, there are parts of the country that have received moisture and have got some forage and grass. It may be possible to ship your cows into other regions have some custom grazing done and bring them back a few months later. If that is the case, I tell you to be aware of the trucking bill with shipping costs being what they are right now. The shipping costs may exceed the actual cost of grazing if you look at that, but eliminating some cow inventory may be a dire necessity at this point in the year as you assess your own ranch operation. Fifth thing we get to also covered recently in cow-calf corners is just monitoring body condition on cows. If you've got cows that are thin right now as you wean, having lived through the summer that we've been through in Oklahoma, uh, you may not want to put the feed resources into them, but now is the time to do it. It's more easy for those cows to recapture flesh when they're dry and get to an adequate body condition level prior to calving. And if we get that done right now, it's going to pay dividends on the breed back and the reproductive efficiency that we see going into next spring on our cow herds. I hope this helps and thanks for joining us this week on Cow Calf Corner. Dr. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, is here now. Kim, let's dive into the markets first thing and talk about overall what are the markets concerned about. Well, right now, that most people are talking about it's between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and there's just not much happening in the market, which there's some truth to that, but it's not as significant as it used to be because we're in a world market with wheat, with corn, with beans, with cotton. All those prices are determined on the world market, not on the U.S. market. So changes in prices are more significant now than, say, they were 10 years ago. The, uh, the uh, rumors on the market are what they're talking about. It's the Federal Reserve and their interest rate raising those. Are they going to raise them? How much are they going to raise them? And what impacts that going to have? You got the value of the dollar. It's went from about 112 down to almost 106. That's almost a 6% improvement in our price our prices on the world market. You've got uh, China, uh, COVID in China, big problem there. Uh, the world's wondering what impacts that's going to have on our markets. Uh, they've been buying soybeans. That's been good for us here in the United States. And of course, I think people are realizing we got to start watching the weather. We've been paying attention to the war, Russia, Ukraine, what's going on there. But the weather is a major factor I think the market's going to start concentrating on. Specifically, what are you seeing in the wheat markets? 
Well, if you look at the wheat chart, you've got a downtrend that started around the 1st of October. It's a gentle downtrend. You've had prices up as high as $9.50. They're down now around $8.60. Over the, the last couple of weeks, they've been sneaking lower. We've been talking about a sideways pattern in those wheat prices, but if you look over the entire time period, we got a little downtrend going on there. Uh, you've got Australia and Argentina. They're in about the middle to a little over halfway through their harvest, coming in near expectations. Got some weather problems in Australia, flooded, floods, uh, roads washed out, having trouble to move some of that wheat into market. You've got EU's exports are, for wheat are relatively strong. You got the world supply of wheat, the stocks to use ratio. Uh, they've been it's been moving down for the last four years and so it shows that stocks are tight and then you've got the u.s uh, winter wheat uh, conditions which are bad but they've improved a little bit over the last couple of weeks what are you seeing as far as corn then now that's a dead market i mean that market's just been moving sideways but again if you look october forward we had those sideways movements through october into november but in november We've got just kind of sneaking down a little bit. And if you got a floor on those prices, we're right near that floor. If they break it, then we can get some down moves in corn, or they may just continue to waller around, but just not much happening in corn. You look at uh, soybeans. Uh, now there, we got some improvement in bean prices this week. Uh, it looks like it's broke that uh, upper resistance level. We might have beans moving a little higher, but China's been in buying, sneaking in and buying our products here. And that always has a positive impact on our prices. Cotton harvest is winding down in Oklahoma. How are prices looking there? Well, you know, cotton was up 120, uh, and that was excellent prices. Then it's broke and started down. It got down to $72, went back up to 89, uh, around 83. It's, uh, it looks like, like it's creating a floor around 80 cents. Uh, we've got a short crop, and we've had a short crop. To, this is the second out of the last three years. So cotton stocks are relatively tight. Hard to believe we're in December. I know the year flies by, but what are you already looking ahead to for next year? Well, producers are already starting to look at how they're going to use their assets this next year, their, the soil, the land. Uh, you look at wheat, uh, current price $8.65, a basis around a minus 47. Forward contract for harvest delivery, $8.20. That's a minus 55 basis. Uh, corn, $7.32 uh, current with a plus 70 basis. You go out to the 23 crop, it's $5.80 with a minus 25 cents. So corn tight stocks there, really strong basis. Soybeans, $14.50, current price, uh, the basis of minus 10. Go out to the 23 harvest, the basis is a minus 85 at 13.10. Cotton, 85.50, current on the futures. You look at December of next year, around 78.65. Okay, Kim, lots of great information. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week. Today, I thought I'd share a little bit of information about microwave ovens. Percy Spencer, an engineer with Raytheon, the defense technology company, is credited with inventing the microwave oven in 1945. Today, all microwave ovens operate by using the same general technology. Microwaves are generated inside of the oven by an electron tube called a magnetron. The microwaves are reflected by the metal walls of the oven and are absorbed by the food. The microwaves in turn cause water molecules inside the food to vibrate. It's this vibration of the water molecules that generates the heat which cooks the food. This is why it's important to be very careful when removing foods and beverages from the oven because they can become quite hot. It's also important to note that items cooked in a microwave oven do not become radioactive. Glass, paper, ceramic, and some types of plastic containers are all considered to be microwave safe. In other words, microwaves can pass through these materials without being blocked. However, they can become hot from the heat of the food cooking inside. This is why some types of plastics should not be used in microwave ovens because they can melt from the heat produced by the cooking food. Metal pans and utensils can reflect microwaves and therefore should not be used because they can cause uneven cooking and can potentially damage the oven. 
The Food and Drug Administration has regulated the manufacture of microwave ovens since 1971. Microwave oven manufacturers are required to certify their products meet safety performance standards created and enforced by the FDA. In the past, there were concerns that microwave ovens could interfere with the operation of certain types of electronic cardiac pacemakers. Current pacemakers are designed to shield against this type of interference. However, patients with pacemakers should consult with their healthcare provider if they have concerns. So just a little bit of information if you are curious about microwave ovens. For more information, please visit sunup.okstate.edu or food.okstate.edu. For the past two years, we've been uh, doing a podcast it's called the Extension Experience Podcast. It's hosted by three area specialists from the Northwest uh, District of Oklahoma. Uh, Josh Bishong, our agronomist, area agronomist up there, uh, Trent Malachik, our area economist, and myself, Dana Zook. And we started the podcast just to offer a different programming type. Um, we host a variety of different topics. Um, of course, I talk a lot about nutrition, a lot about different livestock. Um, Trent talks about the economics of variety of grains and cattle. And then Josh brings, brings it out, rounds it out with um, agronomy topics um, that producers are interested in. We try to look at um, realistic topics for Oklahomans. Um, we try to get give people a, a better view or a different view of extension. So we introduce state specialists and talk about um, things that are going on in extension. So um, if you would, if you're interested in the podcast, you can find it on a variety of podcast apps, but we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. But you can also find us on our blog and, and a link to that will be on the SunUp website. I hope you are able to tune in. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can see SUNUP anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SUNUP.